giving you that free will so that you can, you know, do whatever you want to do and that he just wouldn't be able to stop you. But that's a law. God does not go against his own self, his own truth, his own justice, his own holiness. He doesn't go against his own laws. He doesn't go against his own structure, his own order. So to, so to, um, take your free will from you would be counter to the way that he has designed things to be. And in fact, he, in his wisdom, gave you that free will so that when you are acting in accordance with his expectations, with his laws, with his precepts, with his guidance, it is truth it is coming from you because you desire to follow him. You desire to be with him. You desire to do the right things. There is a scripture that speaks about our prayers. And it talks about the fact that sometimes our prayers are not answered because we are not praying in an appropriate way. In other words, our motive behind the particular prayer is not truth, is not love, is not mercy, is not justice. Our motive, the reason that we're asking or desirous when we're praying about a particular thing to come to pass, our motives aren't pure, aren't holy. Because obviously, if you prayed, Lord, please help me, I'm going to go rob 7-Eleven and I need your help. Make sure the police don't see me, let me get away with it. Obviously, that is not the type of prayer that God is inclined to answer. I mean, right? <laughs> right? So, he, he doesn't go against his own nature. He's not going against himself, his laws. And so, when we're praying, he wants our prayers to be in line with his will. In line with what he desires for us and for others. So then... There is even a better example right there of how God is so just, uh, how he is so even-handed, how his holiness is 100% all the time, every day, all day, from all eternity. Even in our prayers, he is just. Even in our prayers, he's merciful. He understands even when we're not praying with good motives, he understands. Even when we yell out in anger towards him or others, he understands. He understands our limitations because he has created us. And you know, many people who are parents... Um, you know, they know when uh, their child does something, whether it's something, you know, particularly uh, uh, intelligent or even particularly unintelligent, we know that's my child. And why do we know that? Because we know what we know about ourselves. We know what we have raise them to be, what we're teaching them to be. We know them, sometimes we know our children better than they know themselves and God certainly knows us far beyond what we even understand about ourselves. So, when we do that stupid thing or say that stupid thing 
first of all, he knew that you were going to say it or do it. But he also understood why you did it or said it. So, in holiness, we can see the full spectrum of God's justness, his truthfulness, his divine legislation. You know, I'm using the word divine because divine speaks to that supernatural, speaks to that that superior manifestation that we don't find in ourselves. Divine as in exclusive. Divine as in high. Divine as in awesome. Divine as in pure and wholesome. Divine. Everything about God is divine, far above whatever we can imagine or think. His ways are higher than our ways, His thoughts higher than our thoughts, as we have said before. So those are um, mercy, truth, love, justice, and holiness. The five characteristics that I promised that we would talk about. But I also said that we would talk about the various names of God. The various titles of God. And in those we would also be able to understand more about who God is, what God is, where he is. How can we become more in line with his expectations, what he desires us to be? Well, let's just look at some of the names, titles, attributes that scripture has given. And I can tell you there are over a hundred different scriptures throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. So I'm just going to give you a few. If you go to 1 John 2 and 1, you will find that God is spoken of as an advocate. He advocates for us all. If you go to Revelation 1 and 8, you'll find that God is spoken of as almighty. 1 and 8, Revelation 1 and 8 also says that God is the Alpha. Revelations 3 and 14 says that God is the Amen. In other words, He's the end. He's the final statement. The buck, the buck stops with Him. Genesis 16 and 7 says that He is the angel of the Lord. Psalm 2 and 2 says that He is an anointed one. Hebrews 3 and 1 says God is an apostle. Hebrews 12 and 2 says that God is the author and the perfecter of our faith. Revelations 21 and 6 says God is the beginning. 1 Peter 2 and 25 says God is the bishop of our souls. Zechariah 3 and 8 says God is a branch. John 6, 35 and 48 says God is the bread of life. Matthew 9, 15 says God is a bridegroom. You've often heard that the church is the bride and God is the bridegroom and he is going to return to get his bride. Mark 6 and 3 says God or Jesus is a carpenter. First Peter 5 and 4 says that God is the chief shepherd. Matthew 1 16 says God is the Christ. Jeremiah 8 18 says God is a 
comforter. Luke 2 and 25 says that God is a consolation of Israel. Ephesians 2 and 20 says that God is the cornerstone. You know, the cornerstone in the building is the primary stone. The stone that carries the weight. The stone that sets the, the pace and the distance and the, the height and the depth of the entire building. Luke 1 and 78 says that God is a day spring. 2 Peter 1 19 says God is a day star. Romans eleven twenty six describes God as a deliverer. Haggai 2 and 17, God is the desire of the nations. Matthew 1 23 says God is Emmanuel. Revelation 21 and 6 says God is the end. Isaiah 9 and 6 says God is the everlasting Father. Revelation 3 and 14 says that God is a faithful and true witness. 1 Corinthians 15 and 23 says God is the first fruits. Isaiah 28 and 16 says that God is a foundation. Zechariah 13 and 1 says God is a fountain. Matthew eleven nineteen says that God is a friend of the sinners. John 10 and 7 says that God is a gate for the sheep. 2 Corinthians says, describes him in 9 and 15 as a gift, the gift of God, speaking here of the Messiah. John 1 and 1 simply says, God is God. Isaiah 60 and 1 says, there is glory associated with God. John 10 and 11 calls him the good shepherd. Matthew 2 and 6 says that God is a governor. Hebrews 13 and 20 says he is the great shepherd. Psalm 48 and 14 says that he is a guide. Colossians chapter 1 and 18 calls God the head of the church. Hebrews 3 and 1 says that he is a high priest. Isaiah 41 and 14 says he is the Holy One of Israel. Luke 1 and 69 calls him the horn of salvation. And Exodus 3 and 14 says he is I am. Psalm 83 and 18 calls him Jehovah. Matthew 1 21 calls him Jesus. Matthew 27 and 42 calls him the King of Israel. 1 Timothy 6.15 calls him the king of kings. John one twenty nine says that he is the lamb of God, speaking of the Messiah, Jesus. 1 Corinthians, speaking of Christ, the Messiah, calls him the last Adam, 1 Corinthians 15 and 45. John 11.25 calls him life. John 8 and 12 and John 9 and 5 call him the light of the world. Revelation 5 and 5 refers to God as the lion of the tribe of Judah. 1 Timothy 6.15 says that God is the Lord of Lords. Matthew 28, uh, excuse me, Matthew 23 and 8 call him Master. 1 Timothy 2 and 5 call him the mediator. John 1 41 calls him Messiah. Isaiah 9 and 6 calls him a mighty God. Revelation 22 and 16 says that he is the morning star. Matthew 2 and 23 calls him the Nazarene. Revelation 1 and 8 calls him Omega. 1 Corinthians 5 and 7 refer to him as the Passover lamb. Matthew 9 and 12 says that he is a physician, the doctor. 1 Timothy 6 and 15 also call him the potentate. Hebrews 4 and 15 calls him a priest. Isaiah 9 and 6 calls